I think we got to stop telling kids the lie that you need a college degree to be successful and that this is going to cause you to make X number of dollars more. George, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I am doing well. I'm thrilled to have you. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, including your work with Dave Ramsey and your podcasts and the documentary that, that's come out. Uh, but why don't you just start by telling folks, you know, who you are, and I'm particularly interested in how you got into this whole personal finance thing. Yeah, I started at Ramsey Solutions eight years ago as an intern and a temp. And so I was in the marketing world. I was a musician, not not great at it, but I, I really enjoyed the marketing side of trying to reach people with with the message and with the art form. And so that got me into marketing. And so I landed a job here doing some social media and I loved what Ramsey was doing. And after four years being in different marketing roles, email marketing and social media, I stepped into a host role. They saw me on stage at an internal company event. And I, I've always loved being on stage, obviously as a musician and connecting with, with an audience. And so I started doing that. I was hosting the Ramsey Show live stream during the breaks. I was hosting live events started hosting some podcasts, our Borrowed Future podcasts, our Foundations in Personal Finance high school curriculum. And uh, recently, early this summer, I stepped into a full-blown kind of personality role where I get to teach people our framework and share my money story and help people get a, get a hold of their finances. And so That's it's been a, a wild eight-year journey, but really I'm, I'm the Ramsey test tube baby. When I started working here, I said, hey, I'm, I'm $40,000 in debt, 36000 in student loans, 4000 in credit card debt. If I really want to work here long term, I probably should do the steps and see if they actually work. And it turns out they do work. And I ended up meeting my wife here, who, who still works here today. And we are now on what, you know, Dave would call baby step six. We're trying to pay off our house early and we're on track to do that in the next four or five months. And so we are so excited. Uh, and I just want to spread the message that it, you don't have to be where you are financially. You can grow. You can get better. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be wealthy. You just have to take the right steps. That, that's great. Now, I just have to ask you, have you followed the steps to the letter? To the letter. Or have you? Nice. You name that's it, great. I, I've done it. I don't think there's a single misstep I took. I wasn't, you know, we call it Dave-ish around here when you go, yeah, I'm doing a little bit of this, but I'm also doing a little bit of my own thing over here. I went, hey, this is a proven plan that's worked for millions, and I get to meet the fans who's, who do it that way, and they're absolutely inspiring. The level of sacrifice and gazelle intensity is what we call it. Uh, really serves you well for your financial future. So I decided, you know what? Dave's been doing this a long time. I'm not going to try to do my own plan because my plan kind of sucked. I've tried my plan. Let's try his plan. And so it's been a, a wild journey, and I'm just so excited to spread this message to a whole new audience. Well, so I'm probably Dave-ish, <laughs> as you described it, but that's okay. Uh, so step two is pay off all your debt, right? Do I have that yeah. right? So, and you said you're, you're working on step six. So when you got done with step two, I just have to know, did you call into the Dave Ramsey show and scream that you're debt free? You know, I worked here at the time. And so in the, I think in the moment I felt like, well, we, we do a lot of uh, team member debt free screams and they're very inspiring. But at the time, for some reason in my head, maybe I had some stage, stage fright back in those days. I decided not to get on the stage and yell that I'm debt free. But right. let me tell you this, when I pay off my house, uh, if Dave will let me, because, you know, I sit in the seat next to him now as we co-host the Ramsey show, but it would be really fun to be across the glass on that debt-free stage with my wife, who's also a team member here, and share our story about paying off our house. So that's something I do plan on doing in early 22. Oh, that would be great. Well, good luck with that. Thank I'll just you. share my one Dave Ramsey thing. You probably can't read this, but that's a note. Oh, and, yeah. And I was I was listening to the Dave Ramsey show. This is June 15th, 2005. And people were screaming debt free and it kind of aggravated me. It's like, you know, I want that. So I wrote in here, I will be totally debt free by June 15th, 2012. So I gave myself seven years. OK, I failed. I was not debt free by 2012. But, you know, I was debt free, including the mortgage a few years later. I wow. never did call into the show and scream. I'm. Uh, that I'm debt free, but he, he, that his show certainly motivated me, even if I didn't follow his steps exactly uh, to take control, you know, of my finances. So that's awesome. anyway, so that's that's a, a great sort of segue into a couple of, of money topics I want to talk about, and they come primarily from your podcast, The Fine Print, but you also have uh, Entree Leadership, and I've listened to both. But why don't you tell everyone a little bit about those those podcasts? 
Absolutely. So The Fine Print is our, our newest podcast, and this is really where I wanted to take a different approach to anything we've ever done here at the Ramsey Network. And so it's a narrative storytelling type podcast. They're about 30 minutes or so, and they hit topics head on. And what I wanted to do with this was really unpack the hidden truths that are keeping people broke, uh, especially things that are trending. Because I believe if you if you fall if you follow the trends, you will fall for the traps. And that's what I'm seeing with uh, generationally with a lot of millennials and a lot of Gen Zers. They're listening to their broke friends. They're reading the headlines. They're seeing what's happened in the crypto world, and they're just kind of jumping in to all sorts of things and doing way too many things at once, and then wondering why they're not making financial progress. So in these episodes, it's not just me monologuing for 30 minutes. It's talking to experts in the industry. It's hearing from some of our Ramsey personalities. It's sourcing real life stories of people who have experienced some of these things. And then we have a, an actionable ending that people can take to take some steps towards a better financial future. So that's really what the podcast does. We, we hit on a lot of topics, as you know, uh, from cryptocurrency to credit scores to credit card rewards to the housing uh, you know, crisis here that we're seeing with this housing gold rush. Uh, bankruptcy, all kinds of topics that affect your personal finances. And then Entree Leadership, we cover business and leadership. So if you are a business owner, a small business owner, maybe you're a leader, uh, you have aspirational uh, growth to be in leadership one day, we talk to the nation's top leadership experts, authors, speakers, you name it, to try to distill down in about 45 minutes some practical things that uh, the listeners can do to grow in those areas, grow themselves, grow their teams, and grow their profits. Yeah, I was just listening to your interview of Ryan Holiday and kind of how he juggles all the things in his life, which He's was fascinating, was useful. That was helpful. Um, you mentioned trends and you, you, you gave us a couple of examples and we can talk about them like Bitcoin, for example. But what trends are you seeing now that give you concern? One of the biggest ones, and we did an episode on this, is buy now, pay later. And mm -hmm. this is a growing trend. We're seeing some of the biggest retailers in the world jump on this. And it's right below that add to cart button. And instead of $40 for that item, you can pay in four easy payments of $10. And we're seeing this stuff now. You can do this on a pizza. I saw an advertisement. You can get a pizza with buy now, pay later. So some of the companies you've probably heard of are Affirm, Klarna, Afterpay. And these companies, uh, obviously retailers want to use them because they know that the, the customer, the consumer is going to spend way more if this option is available. And Klarna brags about this. They say that the consumer spends 45% more when they use a buy now, pay later service on a retailer's website. And that frightens me because what that tells me is people are not budgeting for things that they need. They're overspending. They're buying things they don't need. They probably impress people they don't even really like that much. And we obviously want people to buy things intentionally and not through impulse and do it with cash so they don't carry debt with payments for months and months for a, a T-shirt that they barely wear. Right, right. What, what's your take on um, uh, Bitcoin? So we I dug into crypto on it. It's just at, at almost an all-time high. They just yeah. launched a Bitcoin futures ETF. Bitcoin in particular, I'm not as, as mad about. Obviously, Bitcoin has done really, really, really well over the span of time. Uh, so Bitcoin versus all the cryptocurrencies out there, there's just so it's so new and it's so volatile that it's not something that we recommend people invest in for uh, for the short term, especially. But in the long term, we just think there's there's a lot of great options out there that aren't going to tank your investment. And we're seeing this with, you know, with Dogecoin, right? It, be, it was the meme coin that kind of got popular. And then Elon Musk is saying it's going to go to the moon and he goes on SNL and he mentions it. And everyone thinks this is our chance. We're all about to get rich. And then they didn't. And it tanked. Right. And so it worries me that we're all kind of downloading the Robinhood app and just kind of hoping for the best and digging into whatever our friends say to jump into next. Whatever the headlines say is going to be hot. And now there's a new coin now and there's this coin over here. And then there was the whole one coin uh, situation where it was a total fraud. And so, uh, you know, there, there's some really cool things happening. I love that the democratization of investing that's going on now where you don't have to be a wealthy guy on Wall Street to jump into investing. But I also think a lot of people are doing it who aren't educated uh, into what they're putting their money into. And it can create a lot of scary situations. And everyone brags about the gains, but you don't really hear a lot about all of the losses. Yeah. 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 It's tough. I, I've always thought that when central banks stop flooding uh, the economy with, with money and interest rates start to rise, that um, 
crypto in general will come come down significantly. But, you know, like you said, a lot of people have made a lot of money. Um, it's not something I've invested in, but I guess time uh, time will tell. Um, so you mentioned credit card rewards. And I know because everyone knows Dave Ramsey doesn't like credit cards. Um, I, I listened to your episode. One of the things that struck me was you, you cited a bank rate study that like 30 percent or 31 percent of folks, <laughs> they don't even use their rewards. Uh, which I, I have to confess that, I mean, I, you know, I assume there'd be some percentage, I suppose, of people that forget about them, but that really shocked me. Uh, but I'm curious, do you see any role at all, uh, any positive role with for folks with credit cards and credit card rewards? You know, I have a lot of friends out there, uh, not here at Ramsey, but they tell me, well, George, I pay my card off every month. I've never paid a dime in interest and I get a free flight, or I, I've taken a free vacation thanks to my credit card rewards. And to them, I say, good for you. I'm not mad at you. Um, you know, I believe a very specific framework when it comes to money. And I believe that there's a higher chance of winning with money and a higher chance of, of wealth if you follow it to a T. And so with credit cards, yes, there's lots of people who think they're gaming the system. And I equated it to kind of a, the Chuck E. Cheese analogy in that episode where you're, you're spending 20 bucks and you get some coins and you play the game and you end up with a, some sticky hands at the end. And you go, hey, look, I won. But you spent 20 bucks to play a game. And so some people find it entertaining to try to move the cards around. And that's what credit card companies want. They want to gamify this so that you spend more time looking at, oh, if I, I can get 5% cash back on gas this month, but next month it's going to be 10% over here. So the people who say, I only spend it on exactly what I was going to spend it on, well, that's not really true if you're really gaming the system because the rewards and offers change every single month. And like you mentioned, a lot of people aren't using these rewards and there's a lot of blackout dates and restrictions. And well, now they change the, the value of the points at any time they can do that. And so, and you don't really know, 30,000 points, I don't know what that equates to depending on what the rewards are and what the company is. And at any point they can say, you know what, those 30,000 points aren't gonna get you what they did a year ago. And so I just don't like that it's not in your control and you're going to do much better off using a debit card, sticking to your budget, sticking to a plan, and rewarding yourself. Give yourself your own vacation. Save up and pay cash. It's not that hard. You know, they do have some debit cards now and checking accounts that actually pay cash back. So I suppose, you know, you might you might go that route if you if you really you know want to stay away from credit cards. Yeah, the debit cards are starting to compete, which I love to see. You know, I uh, one of the cards that I have is a cash. Square, Square has a cash card, and it's a yeah. debit card. And uh, there's a frequent reward every single week, 10% off at any grocery store. And so hmm. I'm a big Trader Joe's fan. And so I go, okay, it's up to 75 bucks. I'll save 750 and I'm using a debit card. And it's money that comes straight out of my account and I feel it and I can go track that amount in my budget. And I still save 10% just like that without having to play a game and spend money on a credit card and try to keep my credit score up. And that's a whole nother situation that's tied to that is this idea of the high credit score. And so I just realized, you know what? I have enough anxiety as it is. I don't need to add to that by trying to play a credit card rewards game. Right, right. Okay, well, that's a good perspective. I, um, you know, I have, I, I'm very much into the credit card reward game, I guess you could say. Uh, but, but uh, you know, if my children, for example, and, and Robbie and Anna, hope you're listening out there, <laughs> uh, I would not be in favor of either of them using a credit card right now. Um, why is that? They, pro they, pro they probably will not be happy that I said that uh, on air. But um, I definitely, you know, they're definitely, uh, they can get you into a lot of trouble. No question about it. Yeah, the people yeah. who, uh, they're, the people who are, quote, responsible with it, you know, they, they encourage everyone to get a credit card. And uh, we wouldn't have these untold amounts of credit card debt. I mean, I, here's the thing. They're not the ones taking the calls on the Ramsey show where people are calling in going, George. I've got $6,000 in credit card debt. I have $20,000 yeah. in credit card debt. And it just breaks my heart to see this happen. And I understand that everyone's different and some people have a different level of responsibility when it comes to their finances. But overall, it's just an evil industry. And I don't want to see anyone be a part of that industry, even if it means they get a free flight at the end of the year. Well, speaking of an evil industry, let's talk about student loans. Yeah, there we so go. You guys, you've put a documentary together, released it. Let me get the title right. Borrowed Future, How Student Loans Are Killing the American Dream. So to begin with, tell us about the documentary, where folks can watch it. I know it, I think it came from a podcast series you did a couple of years ago, if, I, if, if I've got that correct. So tell us about this documentary. 
Absolutely. So back in 2019, I hosted our first kind of narrative series. It was, it was an eight episode series called Borrowed Future on the student loan crisis. And we dug into uh, the, the entire industry. And let me tell you, it got real confusing real fast. Because when you, when you think about it, you go, who's the villain here? Is it just student loan companies? Or is it also parents? Is it also <laughs> guidance counselors? Is it also the colleges uh, charging untold amounts of tuition and increasing it every year? Uh, and so we really dug into this in eight episodes and tried to make it a journey to follow along with. And at the same time, we decided, you know what, this is such a powerful story to tell. We need to capture this on video. And so our video team started along their own journey, making a documentary around the same topic. And so it just released last week. It's called Borrowed Future, How Student Loans Are Killing the American Dream. It's 88 minutes long and it is masterful. It's a feature full length film. And our team did an incredible, incredible job with this. You can watch it right now on Amazon Prime Video, on Apple TV, on Google Play, and you can watch it at borrowedfuture.com. It's just a few bucks to rent. And let me tell you, it is so eye opening. It's one of those things that if you watch this with your kid, it might scare the living fear out of them to never get a student loan. And yeah. that's the goal with this thing. If you have student loans, I want it to make you so angry that you want to go pay these things off this year. And if you don't have student loans yet and it's not too late, we want to show people that you can do it without going into debt, that you can be a student without a student loan, that there is a different way. We've got to start teaching our kids that you don't have to just fall into this college experience and base it on whatever the prettiest campus is and who has the best football team and who has the best. Well, that would be the Ohio State Buckeyes, by the way. So. Yes. Okay. I'll give you that. I mean, we, we love football. And a lot of times, here's, here's the situation that happens at home. The parents say, well, I went to this school and I have a lot of pride in my experience there. And so I want you to go there, regardless of the fact that it's $50,000 more per semester than it was when I went there. And so we dig into all of these issues. We talk to high school students. We talk to industry experts. We feature real life stories that are heartbreaking of people who are drowning in student loan debt, including one guy who went a million dollars into debt. We also feature some inspiring stories of people who were able to do this debt free, who were able to cash flow the college experience through uh, working part time, through scholarships and grants, uh, through you know parents saving ahead of time and being intentional with their money. And so there's a lot of lessons to be learned here. And I want to encourage every American to go watch this documentary to at least understand what's going on with the student loan crisis. How in the world do you go a million dollars into student loan debt? How's it that possible? It was a fascinating story. Uh, I mean, and he was an orthodontist and he actually went to undergrad completely debt free. And you went, where did he go wrong? And with those programs, it can be very competitive, uh, you know, when you want to be an orthodontist. And so you end up going, all right, well, I got into this great program and here's the cost. It's going to be $200,000 a year. And when you have an interest rate on an amount that big, you can't even breathe. And so he's telling us in the documentary, I, I would have to pay ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month just to make a dent in these loans because they are outpacing my ability to pay the minimum payment. Yeah. And it just, it just scares. I mean, he is in tears as he shares the story. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's a lot of people go, well, yeah, George, that's not me. I'm not going to go a million. I'm not that I'm not stupid. Right. And you take on $50,000 in debt, right. Or $20,000 in debt but you don't know what that payment's gonna feel like until you graduate. And then you go, wait, I, I wanna buy a house. I wanna start a family. And you realize I can't do all of these things because my finances are strapped so tight that they're chaining me to my situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's what breaks my heart. When you really zoom out, of, yes, there's a $1.6 trillion crisis and 45 million mm -hmm. Americans. But what I like to do is zoom in on the personal stories and really hear someone's heart about what their yeah. goals are, what their dreams are, and how student loans are holding them back. So that's why I'm so passionate about this mission. Obviously, I had student loan debt, too, and I, I was able to pay them off and get out from under them. And I want that for every American out there. And I don't want them waiting on a government to try to solve the crisis. It's not going to happen. Hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that, that your view and Dave's view is that a high school graduate going to college shouldn't borrow at all. I mean, I think that's right. So uh, it seems to me that creates, there's sort of two things sort of at war with one another. This idea of going to college without any debt, assuming you don't have parents that can pay for it, right? Uh, so going to school without any debt, and frankly, a system that not only encourages debt, but in some ways almost makes it a necessity because you have this admittedly low-cost government 
loans that you can get irrespective of your major, irrespective of your credit score, right? Um, and, and colleges that then, universities that then jack up the tuition, because why not? It's free money that the government's passing out. So how do you, how do you deal with that, that tension where, yeah, yeah you want to go to school without any debt, but tuition, thanks, I think, in part to all this government assistance, is skyrocketing. How do you get? How do you bring those two together in in, in some way? Well, you kind of have to buck the system and go. You know what? I'm not going to go to a fancy name brand school if I don't have the money to pay for it. So that comes down to really uh, your school choice. That is the number one factor uh, in if you can pay for school and go debt free. If you choose an in state school or a community college and start there for two years and knock out your prerequisites and then transfer in and get your four-year degree, that's going to be a much more affordable way to go than going to the private school that maybe your parents went to, your buddies are going to, or has the, the fancy campus or the great football team. These are bad reasons to go get an education, which, let me remind everyone, is the reason you are going to college, not for the experience. Yes, it's great, and it's a great transition period from high school into adulthood, and there's a lot of things that you can learn and grow. But at the end of the day, I want your education to match your goals. So you got to start thinking about this stuff in high school. And I'm not saying you have to know what you want to be when you grow up when you're eight years old, but you do have to start these conversations, especially parents out there. I talk to high school students and I ask them very basic questions. I said, so what do you want to do? Where do you want to go to school? How much is that going to cost? How are you going to pay for that? You would have thought it was an interrogation. They walked <laughs> out of there in tears. And I, I, know I thought to myself, this is the first time anyone's ever asked them this. The parents aren't having these conversations. They have their own problems, their own personal finance uh, problems, their own shame and guilt around this. And they're going, you know what? I'll just sign, co-sign with the loans when it comes time to wherever a junior wants to go to college. Instead, I want this to be a partnership with your, with your parents and the student and go, hey, what do you want to do? All right, great. Let's, let's map out a plan to get there. Here's how much money we have saved. And whatever the gap is, let's figure out a way to do that. Let's have you apply for a lot of scholarships and grants. And what if you could work part-time, which, by the way, we found out, will increase your GPA in your college experience if you work part-time. Now, why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because you have to have a whole new level of discipline. You have to kind of be an adult and go, all right, I've got to make sure I get my schoolwork done and I've got to work. And that means I'm not hanging out, partying, whatever the college oh, that's, experience that's may point. be. Yeah. And therefore, you've kind of got to be up and at them. And uh, that really sets you up for adult life a lot better than the traditional college experience where, hey, someone's going to cook for me every day. And it's just up to me to decide what to do with the rest of the eight hours when I'm not in class. So we're not really yeah. setting up students for success when they graduate into adulthood and get their first job, when they're laden with student loan debt and they don't know how to cook for themselves or do much for themselves because we kind of spoon fed them for four years and said, hey, just have a good time. Yeah, just give us a big pile of money and uh, you can just hang out and get your degree. Uh, so I want people to start being more intentional about this early on. And so parents, if you're listening and your kid is, you know, zero to 14 years old and you still have time to save and maybe an ESA or a 529, pile away some money and get debt free first. Make sure you're taking care of yourself and your retirement before you start saving for college. We always say there's a 50-50 chance that your kid goes to college, but there's a 100% chance that you will retire someday. So what I don't want to see is parents sacrifice for their kids, but not prepare themselves for retirement. And then the kid graduates and he's, they're an adult and they have to take care of the parents because the parents are broke. And we're seeing this with millennials, the sandwich generation. They're trying to take care of their kids, but they're also trying to take care of their parents who are broke, who sacrifice for them, which is very honorable, but not at the expense of their own future. So it starts with conversations and it ends with having a game plan for how you're going to go to college debt free. Yeah, it's a tough thing because a lot of people watching this show are are agreeing completely with you and they're having the conversations with their kids. It's 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 a lot of the families that aren't consuming personal finance content, right? And so the the conversations with the parents never happened and we've got 17 and 18 year olds having to make decisions that frankly, uh, you know, that have ramifications they can't even really begin to appreciate. I, you know, I couldn't when I was 17 or 18 years old. Uh and it makes me wonder, and I don't know if, if you and, and, and the Ramsey organization takes any, take any positions on this, but what policy changes, if any, should be made? Uh, and I don't know if, if, if you guys get into that or maybe you try to just deal with it before the problem actually occurs. 
Uh, but what are your thoughts on, on that? Because there's a lot of policy issues now, you know, from free education to uh, paying $50,000 of each individual student loans or some smaller amount. And to me, it's just putting a Band-Aid on a broken arm. But uh, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on all of that. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. There's a lot of Band-Aids being thrown around that aren't really solving the root problem. And we actually dig into this. Uh, if you check out the fine print, we did a bonus episode, an update on the student loan crisis. And we dug in with industry experts like Seth Brotman, who's featured in the Borrowed Future documentary. He's the executive director of the Student Borrower Protection Center. He was the former mm -hmm. ombudsman for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And he's got a heart to really help solve this thing and help borrowers who've been maybe screwed by their, by their own student loans. And so talking to him, I asked him about these policy updates. I also talked to Josh Mitchell, author of The Debt Trap, about what policy changes would need to happen or may be happening to solve this. And the unfortunate part is there's a lot of finger pointing to the government and to Congress and to the president to go do something about this. And the truth is we're seeing the public service loan forgiveness program with an abysmal 2% rate of people who applied who actually got their loans forgiven. So I don't think that uh, forgiveness is going to be the answer. Even if it was 100% uh, forgiveness rate, that's still a small portion of all the 45 million borrowers out there. And so while I'm all for, you know, people who maybe uh, did have, were served a bad hand, went to a college like DeVry or ITT Tech, where they, it turned out there was some fraud happening and they did have their student loans forgiven. There's a level of personal responsibility that we just have to take as Americans and go, no one's going to solve this for us. And yes, there should be more legislation. There should be more regulation. Uh, we're seeing players like Navient uh, leave the student loan game and go into the, the private sector and, and refinancing, which is great to see some less corruption in the industry. But in the grand scheme of things, the crisis is still what it was two years ago. And it's only getting worse as student loan payments uh, get unpaused. We saw the, the extended student loan relief. That's going to stop. February 1st, you got to start making your payments again. And what are you going to do yeah. about it? You got to have a plan right. to pay these things off. So right. policy changes, I'm all for a certain level of a little bit of forgiveness. If that's going to help a lot of people, I don't know that it will. Um, but at the end of the day, the regulation that needs to change is we need to stop the federal student loan program where an 18 year old can't take a sip of alcohol, but they can sign up for $200,000 worth of student loan debt without yeah. any understanding of what that payment is going to be what the interest rate is, how it all works, the underpinnings of it all. And uh, while I think it's still better than private student loans, which are unregulated comparatively to the federal side, I still think we've got to stop this program where we just hand out free money because of what you talked about. It's perpetuating the cycle of colleges saying, we're just going to increase the tuition uh, by 50% and they'll keep handing out free money. So they'll, they'll keep being able to afford it. And so that therein lies the problem. I think the federal student loan program is at the crux of a lot of the issues we've seen with the crisis and stopping that and putting some regulation around it could really help uh, solve some of this. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, the thing that frustrates me is that even putting aside student loans for a moment, there seems to be a discount, a disconnect between what a, an education costs and what you'll make when you're done, you know, on average. And, and I was an English major and I went to law school, but, I, you know, I was an English major. And if I'd stopped there, I, you know, I'd have probably been in trouble. All the, you know, and, and there's this complete disconnect. And, you know, if you, if you go in and you become an electrical engineer, you're probably going to be fine. If you go in like me and you don't go to law school, you just get an English degree, you know, you, and you borrow. You, even if you don't borrow, you're going to spend money that may not you know, be worth it in the end. And the thing that frustrates me is that the universities have absolutely no accountability. You know, they went on the warpath for, for for profit. OK, maybe that was justified. But I tell you, Yale is graduating all kinds of folks who, you know, get out and get a job that doesn't come near paying student loans or justifying the tuition. And, um, nothing, you know, it seems they, they can do that with impunity and that. OK, I'll get off my soapbox. That's the thing that really gets me. No, I'm, I'm um, with you on that 100 percent. And I think we got to stop telling kids uh, the lie that you need a college degree to be successful and that this is going to cause you to make X number of dollars more. That's a lie that was perpetuated by the colleges and by the student loan companies when you said, hey, you're going to make a million dollars more over your lifetime if you have a college degree. Your college degree does not determine your success. You do. I've met yeah. lots of people who went to trade school, who went straight into the workforce, some that did have a college degree. And their work ethic and their skill set and what they learned and how they continue to grow in their roles. Uh, I mean, I have a communication degree. No one's ever asked me if I have a degree. 
No one cares. What they care about is, can you do the job? Are you growing in your role? How do you want to grow in your career? Those are the questions now, we need to start asking kids. Yeah, I, did, I agree completely. I mean, I, I think that obviously there's a place for college education, depending on what you want to do. I, you know, if I want, you want to be a lawyer, you got to get a couple of degrees. Um, but some of the most successful people I know don't have uh, a degree and, and don't have uh, jobs that you would think would make them multimillionaires. <laughs> Um, you know, very blue collar and they've done smart things with their money and, you know, they retire with two or three million dollars. Well, speaking of debt, you, and I think you alluded to this, you had 40 grand, I think, in debt. I think that was the number. I guess student loans, maybe some credit cards mixed in there. Yes. How did you, I mean, I, I'm going to, you you followed the, the Dave Ramsey approach, but like, can you give us just some some glimpse into what it was like to pay that debt off and maybe what you found that worked really well for you and maybe, I don't know, mistakes that you may have made al along the way? Absolutely. Yeah, I was making my minimum payments like every other American and thinking, well, this is just something I've got to I've got to live with until they're paid off. I'll just keep making minimum payments. Uh, and when I'm out of college, it was really all I could afford to do. I wasn't making a lot of money. And so as I got on this Ramsey plan when I first started here back in 2013, I realized that I needed to do some things differently. I had to cut some expenses. I thought I'm an adult now. Let's have some fun. Let's buy some toys. Let's get a nice car. Let's do all these things. And uh, I realized, you know what? I'm going to have to take a second job. I'm going to have to shave my budget down to bare bones. And so I started driving for Uber and Lyft on the weekends here, here mm. in downtown Nashville. And so I wasn't partying on the weekends. I was picking up the party goers to try to make some extra money. And I worked some side jobs. I was in the marketing world. And so I did some freelance marketing. And so I was building websites and helping people launch their own podcasts and books and things like that to try to bring any extra money I could uh, to pay off those student loans very quickly. And so once I started getting on a budget and I tried to increase my shovel, try to get that income up through side jobs, um, and I really, really dialed down on all of my expenses. I was saying, what am I spending? I'm I'm a single guy and I'm spending $700 a month on food? What am I doing? This is crazy. I'm a little guy. And so once you really take an audit of your budget and where your money's going, it should make you a little angry. And if you're not angry enough yet at your debt, do the math on your interest. See what you've paid, see what you will pay yeah. uh, through the next 20, 30 years as you make minimum payments, and that will get you fired up. And so we did the debt snowball, which is what we teach here at Ramsey. You list your debts from smallest to largest, regardless of the interest rate. And that that's very controversial in today's world because they go, George, that's so dumb. What if you have a 6% interest rate versus 2%? This is not about math. Because if it was about math, we wouldn't be in debt. It's a basic math equation. Don't spend more than you make. And so I realized that progress was more important than the mathematics on it. So I paid off the smallest debt, and now I had a little pile of money to put on the next debt and the next debt. And it snowballs down, and you gain steam along the way. So over 18 months of doing that, I was able to become debt-free, build my fully funded emergency fund, and start investing in our company 401k. That's great. Now, you mentioned the side hustles. And uh, I'm curious... Like when you were driving for Uber and, and, and the other jobs, you were making side income. Were you putting all of that side income to debt? Yes. Every dollar that was going towards it, other than setting aside a little bit for taxes so that yeah. I wasn't surprised at the end of the year, all of that money was going towards debt. It was not going towards funding a new guitar. It wasn't going towards a vacation. When you were in that mode of baby step two, paying off all of your consumer debt except the mortgage, you've got to go full on because I didn't want to yeah. live like this for three years. Truthfully, I don't want to be doing side hustles for four, five, six years. I want to do it for a year or two. And so that's right. exactly what happened. It fuels you to get through it faster and you feel the progress because you actually see debts disappear and you gain that payment back in your life. Yeah, because a side hustle helped me get out of debt too. And what I found is psychologically, you know, it, it can be hard to, to find another 50 bucks or 100 bucks a month in your budget to put towards debt, but psychologically, if you earn a side income, we just see that money differently. At least I did. And, and you know, money's money, but it was like, oh, that's different. And I found it much easier to either put towards debt or just to save if, if need be. Yeah. Because uh, you I'm, feel the I'm sacrifice. Curious, did you, you don't want to see that money thing? waste. Yeah, I, I felt that. When you sacrifice for it, you go, hey, I spent yeah. an entire Saturday for this money. I'm not about to go blow it on something that I yeah. really don't need. I want to put it to work because I don't want to be doing this forever. And so I think yeah. you're right. When you do the side hustles, you feel the sacrifice. You go, I could have spent time doing way more fun things than working more. And so you go, I want to make sure that I put this money to work so that it's working for me and for my financial future. Yeah. 
Well, hey, George, we've just got a few minutes left. Um, one thing I, I wanted to ask you, and I think you may have covered this in your podcast, but you know, the, the pandemic, obviously, for a host of, of, of reasons, uh, threw us all a pretty big curveball in life. And of course, it, it affected a lot of people financially. And so there's talk about, well, how do we sort of bulletproof our finances for the next pandemic? And the, the tough thing is, it's kind of like preparing for a black swan event, which by definition, we don't know what it's going to be. So it's kind of, it's kind of hard to prepare for something that you don't know when it's going to happen or what it's going to be. But are, are there things that, that you've done or that you think uh, viewers can do to kind of prepare, if it's not a pandemic, whatever the next financial catastrophe is uh, that we get ourselves into? Yeah, absolutely. And this was episode three of The Fine Print. We talk about how, how to bulletproof your finances, especially with in the wake of the pandemic. And it really comes down to having an emergency fund. And a lot of people, they experience a lot of different emergencies. Maybe they were laid off. Maybe they had a car repair and they couldn't afford to make it. And so people really, uh, the, they had built a house of cards with their finances and the pandemic just blew that house of cards down. And so everyone had to take a hard look in the mirror and go, oh my gosh, that was really scary. I don't want to get that kind of whiplash again. What can I do? And so what we teach is to get out of debt so that any money you do have coming in stays with you and doesn't go back out to lenders. Mm -hmm. And once you pay off all your debt, we want you to build that three to six months of expenses for the emergency fund so that if there was a job loss, you're going to be okay. You've got six months of expenses ready to pay all your bills, ready to cover all of your emergencies, and you're in a really, you have a good, solid financial foundation. But a lot of people, they have debt payments and they have no emergency savings. And so they turn to the credit cards to fund their life because there's no other way to live. And that's a dangerous spot to be in because now you're talking about maxing out credit cards and super high interest rates. And so we teach people it's basic, but get rid of your debt, build that emergency fund, and you will sleep better at night. And we're not yeah. talking about paranoia levels here with the pandemic. We're just saying, hey, you're going to be OK for six months if you have this yeah. thing in place. Well, and the thing that I think folks should keep in mind is that with this crisis, it was a, obviously a health crisis, a financial crisis. Uh, we got a, a lot, a lot of help from the government. I mean, they flooded homes with cash, stimulus, uh, extra unemployment benefits. And so in some ways, people might have felt like, you know, I actually got through this OK, even though I wasn't prepared as well as I could have been because all of this government money. But, you know, don't relax, don't get comfortable because the next crisis may or may not come with all of that government aid, uh, depending on what it is. Yeah, uh, we saw so, a lot of people. Uh, the emergency fund is critical. Yeah, we saw so many people who were desperate for, is there going to be another stimulus check? And we saw a lot of people who had that money come flooding in through child tax credits and unemployment yeah. and stimulus, and they weren't spending it in the right place. They could have used it to become financially free, get rid of their debt, build an emergency fund. But they may have you know, had that pandemic retail therapy going on where they said, I got to buy some stuff. Life is stressful. Let's upgrade the car. Let's do some house repairs. Let's have some fun. And then lo and behold, they're still in the same financial situation they were in. Once the government yeah. relief stops, which it, it has and it will. Yeah. Or they bought GameStop stock or maybe Bitcoin and they're millionaires. Yes. Who knows? Yeah. Um, if that's you, I'm, I'm happy for you. It worked out. Yeah. But for a lot of people, it's a, it's a scary situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, George, listen, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Why don't you just tell everyone, you know, where they can find you, how they can connect with you and what you're what you're up to next in in your career? Absolutely. Well, you can find me at George Camel. That's K-A-M-E-L, Camel with a K, on Instagram and Twitter and all those places. And if you want to check out some of the podcasts I mentioned, you can go to fineprintpodcast.com. You can go to ramseysolutions.com and check out all of our shows and our resources we've got there. And of course, the Borrowed Future documentary. Go watch this. It is so, so good, so eye-opening. You can find that at borrowedfuture.com. Oh, that's great, George. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.